welcome everybody to Mindful Social. This week, I'm really excited to have Dory Clark here. I've been following her career for a long time. She's a marketing strategy consultant. She's a professional speaker. She contributes to the Harvard Business Review. She has served as a presidential campaign advisor, as a uh, journalist. She writes for Harvard Business Review. She's author of Reinventing You and Stand Out. And her newest book, Entrepreneurial You, is just coming out, and it's really awesome. I think you're going to love it. So I'd like you to welcome Dory. And Dory, say hello. Like hey, Janet. Friend. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad to get to, to talk with you and, uh, and your listeners. No, I'm glad you could be here. And, you know, you interviewed a whole lot of entrepreneurs for this business, really on how to build a business in the new economy. Can you tell us what you mean by the new economy and what, what that's all about? Well, essentially, uh, you know, we, we, we sort of fish for the appropriate descriptors, but in a lot of ways, what, what that is shorthand for is the internet, global business, you know, all, all the things that we can do now mm -hmm. that we couldn't really do effectively 20 years ago when we were at the mercy of dial-up and AOL. And, uh, and so in a lot of ways, um, this ties into entrepreneurship or uh, entrepreneurial sidelines for people because no matter where you live, you have the ability to be in the game and to be doing things. Um, a, there's a lot of professionals out there. I mean, my, my world is, um, you know, a lot of my colleagues are consultants, they're coaches, maybe they're, you know, service professionals of one kind or another. And so the business model always was, okay, you, you have clients, you have meetings with them, they pay you for your time. Uh, and usually there's a little bit of a radius, you know, there's people in your town or maybe you drive, you know, a little bit to see them, but but that's that's about it. Now we literally can be working with people around the world, and we can be doing things at scale. And I think that for a lot of talented professionals, their business model hasn't necessarily caught up to the possibilities. And so what I wanted to do in Entrepreneurial U was do a lot of case studies of really successful six, seven, even eight figure entrepreneurs who, you know, these are not people building the next Uber. They don't have thousands of employees. They have, you know, they're either solopreneurs or do they have a tiny little handful of people that work with them. And yet they're able to be enormously successful because they have leveraged the power of what the internet and, uh, and global business has to offer. Mm -hmm. So the, have you really think that this has leveled the playing field for solopreneurs to be able to really compete with people, you know, Jack Canfields of the world who have a big posse that does a lot of work for them? Um, has the internet changed how all of that works? Well, you know, like all things, right? I think, I think in, so, in some ways it has and in some ways it hasn't. Um, first, you know, the good news, the ways that it has... It, Back in the gatekeeper era, if you were not acceptable for some reason to the powers that be, if, if a handful of decision makers in New York or Washington or wherever the locus of your industry was, if they did not think that somehow you measured up for whatever reason, maybe because you didn't go to the right school or you didn't have the right credentials or, oh, sorry, you're a woman or you're not white or you know, whatever it is, they could just say, no. And you would not have any recourse. Mm. And that's just kind of how it was. And so here, we now live in this gatekeeperless world where, yes, there's a huge amount of noise. There's a huge amount of competition because everyone's trying to get in. But the playing field actually is level because if you, no matter who you are, no matter what tiny town you live in, no matter what you look like, no matter what your background is, if you can mobilize enough people who say, yeah, what she's saying is interesting, I want to hear more of that, then who cares what the, the elite power brokers say or think about you? You have enough people to create something really viable and really valuable in the world. I've seen that a lot too. And, you know, in, in my business, social media, you know, seeing people rise to the surface just by being very loyal to their, the people that follow them and also to their own values and, and really sticking to that because it's really a lot about building a personal brand, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Yeah. So can you give us some examples of entrepreneurs that really leapt out for you? Yeah, there, there were so many great case studies that, uh, that I experienced yeah. in the course of, of writing Entrepreneurial You. And uh, with, with each one, I mean, for me, I really, in a lot of ways, wrote the book because I wanted to learn those lessons. That was, uh, that was something that was important and valuable for me as well. So, uh, so it, I was able to, to grow my business through it. But I'll start with one example. Uh, one of the people that I, that I profiled in Entrepreneurial U is a guy named Dove Gordon. And something that he did that I found really impressive and valuable um, was the, the way that I got to know him was he actually formed a, an online community. Um, no, no cost, but uh, in, invitation only called JVMM, Joint Venture Marketing Mastermind. And basically it's, it's an online listserv for people who do affiliate promotions. And you know, for, for folks who are not familiar with that, that's basically where uh, folks who have some kind of a, an online following, uh, you know, if, if you, Janet, had a, let's say a course or some product that, that you had to offer. And I thought, oh, you know, my audience would really like what Janet has to offer. I would promote it. And then if people bought, I would get a, a, a commission of some sort from you. And so it's, it's a very much, you know, symbiotic sort of thing. And so Dove created this community that enabled people to come together and support each other and, you know, create these mutually beneficial relationships. Now, was it helpful for him? Of course, because he was able to, uh, to meet these folks and get them in, in his orbit as well. But it was also generous in the sense that there, you know, there's no rule that they have to do a promotion with him. Uh, they don't even have to have anything to do with, with him. It, it's, uh, it's about building relationships throughout the group. And that has enabled him to, to dramatically scale his business. And I think that for me, that in a lot of ways is the starting point, is that we have to take a generous mentality. Mm -hmm. We are not in a zero-sum world anymore. If we are able to build a community around ourselves and and help you know raise the uh the status and the stature of everyone in that community together that will benefit us it's not about tearing down the competition it's about creating a symbiotic web of relationships where we can all help promote each other and when you do that great things happen i totally agree you know i think generosity is really something that's really been driving the internet you know yeah you can get paid for your courses but you don't start with paid courses. You start with generously giving information and when people start to know you and you build that trust and that sense of community, then good things are gonna happen. Whether they're the things that you thought were gonna happen or something else is a totally different discussion, right? Totally, totally. Yeah. I love that example because you know there are a lot of bad examples of joint venture type of organizations where it's really, all about you know multi-level marketing kind of stuff but they're not all like that so you know i, th I thought that was a really great example in the book what else yeah. you got <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right hit hit me here <laughs> <laughs> well you know Another story that, that I particularly like um, when it comes to what I think of as being the essence of the, the entrepreneurial experience in a lot of ways is about a, a young woman named Stephanie O'Connell. And Stephanie is, uh, she actually moved to New York because she wanted to be an actress. You know, she had, had this sort of uh, stereotypical dream almost that she wanted to come be on Broadway. Uh, but of course, she, she gets here, she realizes that it is really hard to make a living. And so she's having to watch her money very carefully. So she starts uh, actually, you know, m becoming more aware of personal finance. She realizes, okay, I've got to, I've got to figure this out. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to stay here very long. Mm -hmm. And she starts learning more. And she actually starts sharing her experiences because she realizes there's a lot of other people in her situation. You know, young millennials that that don't necessarily know a lot about how to manage their money. So she started a, a blog called The Broke and Beautiful Life, <laughs> and uh, and she, you know, starts uh, starts getting out there. And she realizes, you know, oh, this, this is interesting. You know, this, I'm, I'm getting actually a little bit of traction with this. And so she begins to think, wait a minute, maybe, maybe I could actually help other people, you know, make, make a difference in their lives and build a career around this. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people maybe have found themselves at this point where they discover, oh, you know, I have something interesting to say, but 
I, I don't, I don't necessarily know how to scale it. You know, we can, we can all see, um, all right, you're starting here. And then you, you look at, uh, you know, the Susie Ormans of the world and it's like, oh my gosh, well, how do I get there? That's a million miles away. And the, the key thing is that so many people give up in between because they say, well, you know, it's just not happening. You know, I've, I've been at this for a while and, you know, I'm not, I'm not getting the, the traction and so I'm just going to quit. Now, the problem is that for a lot of people that I've been at this in a while, oftentimes means, oh, I've been at this two months and Oprah hasn't called me yet. So <laughs> what's the problem? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Exactly. Yeah. And so in my conversation with Stephanie, she said something that I thought was, was really powerful, which is that what, we, what was really essential to her as she built her platform and built her career as a personal finance expert was finding ways to really focus on incremental goals and see seeing the small signs of progress to keep herself motivated and engaged and knowing that she was moving in the right direction. Because you know what, you're not going to go from total unknown to world expert in a year. That's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so if you have, if you have the patience and the forward momentum, you can keep it up. And so for her, uh, you know, what she realized is, okay, I might not be on, you know, the, the cover of the New York times tomorrow, but the difference for her was seeing, okay, at first I had to blog for free everywhere. And then I started to get paid. And even if it was only $25 a post or $50 a post, someone was saying that my, my post was worth money. It was worth paying for. That was a victory. She looked for other small victories, like when someone that she really admired retweeted her posts. That was something that she said, okay, that's positive momentum. When she was actually approached by a media outlet to write for them. She, you know, up till that point, she had always been pitching herself. Oh, please take me. Please let me write for you. When somebody came to her, that meant she was getting somewhere. And so I think for all of us, we need to start thinking about how, how we can recognize and celebrate those small milestones because that's what really keeps us engaged on the path to success. Otherwise, you will get discouraged. You will give up. And ultimately, sometimes just a little more persistence can get you to the place that you want, but you have to build in the system so that you know that you're moving the right way. Yeah, and I love that, that you say, you know, you have to celebrate because even the small wins are wins. And it's very easy for us to gloss over those and, and not celebrate them and not spend the time, uh, you know, recognizing that things are getting better. You know, it's, um, we all think that we're going to be Gary Vaynerchuk and, you know, it took him a long time too. <laughs> it wasn't easy. Totally. It wasn't easy. So that brings the question of um, really, social proof and, and what that means in building a community around yourself and kind of, uh, you know, building up that presence. How do we get social proof and what does it mean? Yeah. So, so social proof, you know, this is, this is a term that I, that I use a lot. It's, uh, it's borrowed from the, the world of psychology and, you know, essentially we can think of it as, as being uh, a, ter a term that refers to your credibility. What, you know, what is it that shows other people that you are credible and that you are worth listening to? And in fact, one of the cornerstones of an online course that I do um, called Recognized Expert is that there's three fundamental ways that people become recognized experts in their field. And that is by number one, doing content creation so that other people can really see what your ideas are and be able to tell for themselves that they're good. Number two is social proof. What is your credibility and how are you conveying to them that you should be listened to? And then third and finally is about having, having a strong network mm -hmm. so that you have other people to question you, to help get you better, and to help support you as well on your rise. But so when we think about social proof, there's a number of things that, that you can do um, to, to be able to hasten that process. And so ultimately, it's, it's thinking what are the brand names that I am affiliated with now or that I could be affiliated with that, that maybe I could, I could try to attach myself to so that in some ways it, be, it becomes uh, a way to borrow their credibility to make it easy for people at a glance to say, oh yeah, of course, this person's been vetted. So, you know, one thing of course is, uh, well, sometimes it's, it's where, where you have your degree from. Maybe you, you know, have an MBA from a prestigious school or something like that. That's one form. Um, but there's also things that are, 
uh, available to everybody, regardless of, of what your background is. So for instance, on the content creation front, if you start uh, writing for a prominent publication that people have heard of, that is a form of credibility. People say, oh, well, if she's good enough for Forbes or if she's good enough for entrepreneur, she must be good enough for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Another one is, is taking a leadership role in a professional association. So if you, and, and you know, honestly, sometimes people don't understand, these are not necessarily hard to get. Like these are volunteer roles. So it's not like people are, are killing each other. Like, Oh, I'm no, I'm going to be the membership secretary. You know, it's like, like a lot of people just think Which, oh, okay, God, nobody happened. wants that job. <laughs> That's right. But if you have it, what it is, people don't realize it's carte blanche mm -hmm. for you to reach out to anyone in that entire organization, you have an excuse. You're the membership secretary mm -hmm. or you're the treasurer or whatever it is. And you, you do that and it gives you status in that organization. It gives you name recognition and people say, oh, well, you know, she's a leader in that group. That makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's something, I'm an introvert. And so one of the things that I've discovered is that when you are the membership person, now you have a way to go and talk to everybody else in the organization and that opens so many doors for you and it's so much easier then to approach people and, and you know, create those relationships. Um, and then kind of on the following the relationship thread, some of the things that, you know, we talk to people about a lot with social media is to figure out who the influencers are and how you can, you know, become incorporated with them and, and get to know them and build those relationships. So let's talk a little bit about that. How do you, how do you decide if somebody's an influencer or they just bought 300,000 fans? <laughs> well, you know, I, I think it's actually an interesting question and it really does tie in with, uh, with social proof in a lot of ways. If, um, you know, you, you look at some of the more visible metrics, you know, let's, let's say like Twitter followers or something like that. But if somebody has a huge number of followers and you've never heard of them <laughs> now, it could be that if it's not your world, maybe you just don't know. Like, mm. I don't know a lot of, you know, Bravo reality stars, you know, I mean, it's okay. Sure. Sure. You know, you, you are world famous from being on this random TV show. Okay. Like, you know, I wouldn't necessarily know them, so I wouldn't write them off, but what you do is you cross check and you say, okay, why do they have so many followers? Oh, well, it says in their bio, they were on this Bravo reality show. So that makes mm. sense. Um, but you look for other things. So let's say someone is in your field and you've never heard of them and they seem to have this huge following. Well, what's, what's that about? That doesn't make any sense. You want to look for the other markers of success because they usually come in tandem. Do they, do they have a book that's been published or, you know, even, you know, more saliently, you know, some kind of best selling book? Have they, um, do they seem to have relationships with other people? Like who's following them on Twitter? Are the other thought leaders that you've heard mm -hmm. of following them or who's blurbed their book? You know, who do they seem to know or have relationships with? Um, you could look at um, at their their content creation. You know, ha, are, have they been writing for prominent publications, or do they seem to have their own thing? I mean, it would be kind of weird if you had a million Twitter followers, but you look at other social avenues, like let's say on YouTube, and there's like nothing about them on YouTube. Well, like that's strange. You know, mm -hmm. shouldn't there at least you know shouldn't they if if they don't have their own YouTube program, shouldn't they at least have been interviewed by some other people? Um, so you begin to sort of you know cross reference in that way. And what about off social media? Because even though social media is the center of my universe, it isn't the center of everybody's universe. There's a lot other ways to kind of raise that visibility. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of it too is, uh, is you know, looking, looking at, their, at their bio and just at, at a basic level, um, you always want to ask, well, what, what brought them to prominence? Could be, because people, people don't become prominent for no reason. And so it's, uh, it's oftentimes a question of a personal affiliation they have or maybe an institutional affiliation. Maybe they used to be um, a, a prominent C-level executive at a corporation, or maybe they've been doing consulting work and they have a roster of, uh, of prominent clients. Those would be reasons why somebody might be able to, uh, to have built up a following over time as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've built up a little bit of social proof and we've connected with some influencers. What's next? Are we, we're giving away great content, 
People are starting to like it. We're starting to get engagement. People are actually paying us once in a while. So what's next? Are we building a platform like Michael Hyatt talks about building a, a, a bigger platform for you to stand on? What do we, how do we take it from there? Yeah, well, I, I think that you're, you're starting in the right place, Janet, because ultimately the point that I make in, in my book, Entrepreneurial You, is that sometimes people come at it and, you know, even when they're just starting out and they say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to come at it and, and, you know, make a lot of money off of, off of my fans right away or something <laughs> like that. And I mean, you know, do you need to make money in the beginning? Of course, <laughs> yes, you do. But I, I think that, um, that sometimes people think of these processes as, as extractive processes. Mm -hmm. And that's not really the right metaphor because if you're really going to fully leverage what is possible in this new economy, you need to be building an audience and building trust with that audience first so that they will then want to buy things from you. Mm -hmm. um, especially something like, you know, like an online course. I mean, there's a wide variety. That could be anything from something amazing and life-changing to something truly crappy. And you have to, you have to, trust the person behind it because the phrase online course can just mean so many different things. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately it, it really does start with, um, you know, often through free content of some kind, building up a relationship so that people over time have been able to say, Oh wow, that Janet makes so much sense. I love, you know, anything she, she's going to write, I want to read it or mm -hmm. whatever it is. And you know, then when you're at that point, that's great because that's when you can begin to sort of flip a switch and you, you continue, of course, to offer things for free. And I think that that's a, a valuable thing, A, to continue expanding your audience, but B, you know, we acknowledge that not everybody can pay for high ticket things or, or whatever. So you continue to do that, but you also begin to realize, oh, okay, I have a loyal audience. What could I do above and beyond what I'm doing now that they might like or appreciate. Mm -hmm. And so this actually goes into something that, um, that I talk about in depth in Entrepreneurial You, which is the process of surveying your audience. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a guy named Ryan Levesque, who I profile oh. that has written a lot about this. He wrote a, a book called Ask, which is mm -hmm. about the survey process. And, you know, essentially at, at a high level, um, he suggests that it's very important to, to survey your readers, um, you know, whether on your blog or if you have an email list or something like that. And he, he suggests that the, the best question that you can ask right up front is what is the number one challenge facing you or, you know, facing your business right now? Mm -hmm. And the reason that's so important is that you might have hypotheses about what is on the mind of your readers, but if you don't ask an open-ended question at first, if you just launched in, oh, what's the most important thing facing your business? Is it cash flow? Is it marketing? Is it, you know, talent acquisition? You're already limiting their worldview. You're already, you know, sort of predisposing them to certain areas. You might not even hear, you might not even have thought about the thing that really matters. And so he wants a qualitative answer as, as the first one. And so you begin to take in, this data to hear what people care about. And you can start to, you know, from the ground up, craft something, not that is like, oh, here's what I think people need, mm -hmm. but instead listening to what they want and specifically, um, you know, this should be something that, that you can add unique value to. And you say, oh, you know, if, if my audience is telling me by a wide margin that the thing that really is most interesting to them is their use of social media and how they can do it better. Well, okay, I have some things to say about that. I can craft something that will be helpful to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes marketers make. You know, we already have a product. And so now we're just going to shove it down your throat because that's what we do. And it, that doesn't work anymore. It doesn't even work with small things, much less services. And if you have a service oriented business, hello, you should be serving. That's kind of the idea, right? Totally. It's, it's crazy. Well, you talk about a lot about online courses, creating digital products. Um, you know, a lot of those things from an entrepreneurial standpoint can be very cost prohibitive. So what kind of, kind of entry level ways can people work that in to start building their brand before they build up enough business to be able to pay somebody else to do it? 
Yeah, you know, and I'm glad, Janet, that you brought it up, actually, because one of the, the mantras that I have is, you know, I, I, for the past 11 years, have run my business, and, you know, I, I do it on my own. I never wanted to create a large apparatus. I have a part-time VA that mm -hmm. helps me, but that's it. You know, that's that's it in terms of my my staff, um, and I managed to, to do a lot of different things, but... It is absolutely true that, for, especially for something like online courses, there are really expensive outfits that will come to you and say, oh, we can create a course for you and, you know, you, you, we'll record it and we'll make it look beautiful and it'll cost, you know, $20,000, $50,000, you know, some crazy price. And I'm sure it is beautiful. I'm sure it looks lovely, but that doesn't make a difference if you're not if, if you're not in a place where you actually have an audience that you could sell a course to that could pay off that huge investment. And right. so I am a really big fan of going, you know, going as, as lean as you can, um, just, you know, creating something good, but, but being scrappy at first when you, you know, you don't even have proof of concept yet. So you want to try to figure it out. So one of the things that I, that I detail in entrepreneurial, you actually um, talk with readers about my process. And so in 2016, I launched my first online course. And the way that I did it, uh, I actually ran a pilot initially for, for just 40 people. And I put them through a, a five-week course. And the way that, that we did it, I didn't even record any official videos up front. We did uh, five weekly 90-minute webinars. Mm -hmm. And I would answer questions. I would present material. You know, these are, these are things that anyone can do. It was incredibly low cost. I mean, you can have a, you know, a Zoom subscription. We're using Zoom right now. You can have that for $16 a month or something like that mm -hmm. and be able to create exactly what you need. So it can be done very low cost, certainly in the piloting phase, but even as you create a more fancy course and, you know, I have uh, now I created a, a fully built out recognized expert course with more than 40 hours of, uh, of detailed content for people mm -hmm. and uh, you know, lots of, you know, videos and, and things like that. And I did it myself. I, re I recorded it with my own equipment that I uh, ordered off of Amazon. And in fact, if people are interested, I, I created as a supplement to the book, mm -hmm. a downloadable guide, which, you know, it's, it's just a little list, but it's, it's literally all the equipment that I used to do the video recordings, I, I just tallied it up. It cost me $234 uh -huh. for the entire set of things that I used to build uh, my course in, in terms of, of recording the video and you know the editing software I used was just free on, on my Mac. But if folks are interested in the exact uh, setup that I use, they can go to doryclark.com slash video tools and they can okay. download for free uh, just the list of, of all the stuff that I used. Well, I'll make sure that's in the uh, blog post as well. Awesome. That sounds like Danny Eine's approach to uh, building courses. He's, he's somebody that I follow a lot that's really kind of following off Ryan Levesque's idea of, okay, ask people what they want, give them a little something to play with and see what really works for them and then build a course. Uh, I love that concept. It, Absolutely. It, it really and Danny is, is someone I also profiled in the book as well. You know, lots mm. of great insights. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, we forget that if we want to be entrepreneurs and we really want to build a business, it, that one-off thing, that really fast, hey, you're going to make a million dollars and then walk away thing, it doesn't last. And then you got to do it again. <laughs> so true. Fun. <laughs> so what other resources have you got in the book? I know one of the things that I really liked is that you have a lot of, okay, now do this. And then you give people ideas to go out and try and, and really put these things to work. It's not just a, hey, read how great I am kind of book. It, I really, I appreciate that you make things applicable. Oh, mm. thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I, I, it was definitely a big theme for me because, you know, if you're writing a book about, about entrepreneurship or about, you know, how to become more entrepreneurial in your own life, whether you work for a corporation or not, um, you want people to take action. That's that's the entire point of it. And so I actually did, you know, to your question about other resources, I did um, pull together a special resource adapted from the book, which is the Entrepreneurial You Self-Assessment. It's 88 questions that actually mm. walk you through the process of how to develop multiple income streams and really think about how to apply these entrepreneurial principles in your own business. And so if folks would like to get that, they can also get that totally free at doryclark.com slash entrepreneur.
Wow, that's great. That's really awesome. I think people are really going to enjoy that. And I, I think they're really going to enjoy this book. I really, uh, I did. I got to read it, read it very early, which is always fun. And, you know, I learn something every time I pick up one of your books. And I, I really appreciate that. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else that you want to say to the listeners besides, hey, get the book? <laughs> well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, mostly I, I would say that part of the reason that I'm so passionate about this, about the importance, if you are an entrepreneur, of diversifying and creating multiple revenue streams in your business, or if you work for a company, just giving giving yourself some kind of side project, some kind of side entrepreneurial venture, um, is that I know from, from my own firsthand experience how important this is. Um, when I was uh, 22 years old, my first job out of graduate school, I was a newspaper reporter, and I ended up getting laid off with a week severance pay. And mm. I had to somehow, you know, find a, <laughs> find a job and a way to support myself. Mm. And I just, I realized that the thing that we've always been told is safe, you know, oh, well, you've got the steady job and the steady paycheck may not be that safe. And if you really want to make yourself safe in the modern economy, it is about diversification. It is about giving yourself options so that you are never reliant on just one client or just one thing, or in the case of entrepreneurs, just one offering that you have because the market ch may change, conditions may change. And if you have that just side thing that you've been cultivating as, uh, as just a little form of insurance, that may turn out to be the thing that can really make the difference for you when you need it. And in good times, well, it can open up entire entire new uh, revenue sources for you that can really make your, your business more lucrative and, and more fun for you. Wow, that's golden advice right there. I love that. Because I really, you know, times have changed. Those days when we got one job and we stuck with it for our entire lifetime, that doesn't happen anymore. It just doesn't. And in the digital economy, being able to pivot on a dime and being able to chase your dreams and grow them is really amazeballs. I just, I love that we're able to do that. Totally. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dory. I, I really appreciated this. And, and uh, I will put the links in the blog post. And this will be going out on YouTube and Spreaker and iTunes and a whole bunch of other places too. And I wish you the best of luck with the book. It's really been a great read. Thank you so much, Shannon. I appreciate it. Thank you.